Good morning, everybody. Do you Dr. Hear me? Alan will present uh, uh, a presentation titled um, Kidney Transplantation in Systemic Diseases. Go ahead, Dr. Ayman, please. Good morning. Thanks for the introduction, Dr. Gohar, uh, Sapri Gohar. Um, thanks for all my professors, colleagues, friends in Enshams University. Uh, and thanks for inviting me again for the second year. I'm really pleased to be with you. Do you hear me well? Do you hear me well? Yes. Yes, Dr. Okay. okay. So the title I was given was a uh, very interesting and challenging transplantation in systemic diseases. Um, so um, I decided to share with you two interesting cases where um, systemic diseases um, uh, have been, the, the, the multi-system disease has been affected in kidney transplantation. So the two real cases and rare cases from my transplant clinic. So the first case, the first consultation was in January, 2015, a 32 year old lady from Asian background, uh, hypertensive. She had an annual hypertension checkup with her general practitioner. And he found that the creatinine was 142 that has led to referral to the renal clinic. When she was seen then, she was asymptomatic, overweight, but otherwise normal examination. Blood pressure wasn't too high, was controlled. Um, no family history of kidney disease. The repeat creatinine was 103 and the urine PCR was minimum. The immunology screen was negative and she had a routine ultrasound that showed a probable small stone in the right kidney. So um, she was referred as outpatient urology and because the creatinine was, um, uh, has come down, she so was discharged back to the primary care for follow-up. Then she lost she lost um, um, follow up with us and with the GP because she moved to Dubai with her husband for a new job end of 2015. Then there she had progressive CKD. She started dialysis there. And in 2017, she went to India for a live donor related, life related uh, transplant. Um, and she had early progressive transplant. She went back to Dubai and she had an early progressive transplant dysfunction and the first three, four months, she lost the transplant function and um, she was back on dialysis. Um, she had a kidney biopsy in Dubai hospital and the report she put back when she came back to the UK showed tubular interstitial damage and ATN was crystal deposition in the tubules. She, she was told, oh, she, she told us that she was given steroids, but she continued dialysis and the, the graft never uh, functioned or never recovered. And then in December 2017, she went back, we moved back to the UK with her husband. She obviously attended the dialysis and that's when I saw her. She was asking for another kidney transplant. Her brother this time was willing to come from India to donate uh, in the UK, which is allowed. Um, she was really keen to have a kidney transplant to complete her family. She only had one child and she's 36. So she wanted to complete the family. We started the workup and there was further question, what's her original disease? Um, so all the what we had then was that report and that history, which is, was a bit vague. So we went back to the pathology department, Dubai hospital, and we asked for more information. And the final report of what we got is just crystal deposition within the tubules looked like oxalate. That has prompted us to measure her serum oxalate. And that was really high, very high. And that, was, that also led us to send genetics uh, DNA sample to the National Hyperoxaluria Service in London, the University um, College of London for genetic testing. So UCL came back saying, this is hyperoxaluria type one. And there was no need at the point to do liver biopsy, which probably would be risky on dialysis. So the diagnosis was confirmed that she had, it was late and retrospective, she had primary hyperoxuria type one. So she's still got these two questions for us. She wants another kidney and she wants um, a baby. So what would you do then? Um, what, did she, what she should do as an option? So I'll give you a few options to think about it if, that's, if she is your patient. Whether she will have daily dialysis with pyridoxine treatment and then she was allowed to get pregnant 
or she should have a combined liver and kidney transplant then allowed to get pregnant or just a liver transplant alone uh, isolated and pregnancy after or the quickest option because she's got a live donor, her higher brother is willing to give the kidney, just isolate the renal transplant and biodoxine, then allow to get pregnant. So obviously it's, uh, I'm not with you now, so it would be difficult to um, ask and raise hands and see what's the opinion, but this probably would be the option to choose from. And it, it would be challenging um, because some of them are, she has to wait and some of them are quick, um, uh, like uh, option D. So uh, I'll tell you what we did. Um, commenced on biodoxine, she was already on that. The dialysis hour extended into five times per week with view to have a daily dialysis at home. She was referred to St. James Hospital in Leeds where this, uh, the liver center, the liver transplant center in the north, to be considered for a liver and kidney or liver only transplant. So that was the, our choice, either to have a combined liver and kidney or liver alone. But her sibling also need attention. So they were referred for genetic testing to see if they've got the disease. And I will tell you why that's important. So she, she was on biodoxine, um, her oxalate serum levels improved, but still very high. Um, she was on daily dialysis at home. The transplant workup started and she was accepted by Lee for a combined liver and transplant. She actually had a, com a successful combined liver and kidney transplant in 2019 and successful pregnancy in 2020. So let's talk more about that rare autosomal recessive inborn error of glycosylate metabolism, which is characterized by overproduction of oxalate and deposition of calcium oxalate in various organs. It's a multi-system. There are three types of uh, primary hyperoxaluria, and the most common and the most severe is type one, 70 to 80% of the cases are type one. Rapid progression to end the stage renal disease by half of the patient will be on dialysis uh, mid -life in the mid, uh, mid age, uh, early adulthood. Um, high urine oxalate and higher incidence of nephrocal stenosis, stones and rapid progression to renal failure. So the effect in that enzyme, which will lead to uh, excessive of uh, glycosylate and excess oxalate and deposition in various organs. While type two, is much rarer, only 10% of the cases, less severe, still progress to end the stage renal disease, but um, the, it's less, they keep taking more longer. The effect in that enzyme this time, the GRH, PR uh, enzyme, and that will also lead to excess um, glycosylate and excess oxalate in deposition. The milder form and less common, the 5% of the cases, is the HOGA deficiency, which is an enzyme in the mitochondrium. So this is the mitochondrium, the liver and the kidney, but also in many cells. And that uh, deficiency will lead to excess glycosylate pyruvate, which will spontaneous breakdown in the tissue to oxalate, calcium oxalate and causing damage. This is, as I said, less common and less severe uh, progressing to end the stage renal disease, but it does as well. So you can see it's a multi-system disease, the, uh, the position of the calcium oxalate in different organs and the heart causing uh, conduction defects. Um, we talked about the kidney, um, stones, obstruction, direct effect on the tubules, progression to end the stage real disease and type one early in life, um, bone marrow pancytopenia, weak bones and the position in the bones, um, retina and reduced um, visual acuity, hypothyroidism, um, so it does affect many organs. So why is it important to make correct diagnosis? Many reasons. There's implication on the treatment. So what we're going to, to offer her, is it daily dialysis? Is it or kidney only? Or is it a combined liver and kidney, depending on the type as well? So it's really important to specify the um, genetic defect and which type of hyperoxaluria. There was implication on the family as well. It's uh, autosomal recessive, one in four. So the risk to her siblings, um, and they may be willing to donate. For example, that brother who wants to donate to her uh, might also have the defect. So it would be very important before proceeding with transplantation to know the genetic defect and to decide what is the best for the patient at the time. Because you can see in some types, it could only, um, only um, a kidney transplant with biodoxine uh, could, could be an option. And the, and, the, and the siblings could be also willing to be left donors. So how to make the diagnosis? 
and sometimes it's very difficult. And you can see in that case, she was diagnosed very late. So clinical suspicious, and, and as, as you can see here, it wasn't straightforward, only one stone. And um, I think it was just, uh, the main diagnosis was the recurrent or the, the, the failure of the first transplant. And it, it, it does happen uh, if the case is not uh, diagnosed. Uh, unfortunately, the urinary oxalate and the serum oxalate are not helpful because as the GFR uh, progressing goes uh, down, um, there will be less urinary oxalate um, and there will be more serum anyway. So it may be not easy. In this case, the oxalate was very high, but sometimes it's subtle and not as high to make a different diagnosis. So the definite is a liver biopsy to see the, the, the activity of the enzyme and the deficiency. Um, but also genetic testing and sending it for to to to, uh, to um, identify the, the genetic defect. How you treat um, symptomatic medical hydration to uh, uh, for less deposition, increasing urinary phosphate, citrate, magnesium, which will lead to um, sol solubility, increased solubility of the calcium oxalate and less deposition. The more effective medical treatment is biodoxine. Um, unproven effect reduce the atrial oxalate or uh, the oxalobacter uh, uh, for visions, which is the um, uh, colonic um, uh, anaerobes, um, given as a probiotic, um, which could be eradicated by antibiotic course, they're not effective enough, especially if higher levels of the serum oxalate, they will not be effective enough. So they, these are all non-proven. Um, so biodoxine is the main treat, medical treatment. Um, so it's a coenzyme of AGT that promotes conversion of the glycosylate to glycine rather than oxalate and reduce the deposition. Effective in up to 30% of type one, which is the most severe type. And but it should be continued for life. It started un or until effective liver transplant. Um, in, in higher doses, uh, administering higher doses was sometimes needed. It can cause a side effect, severe uh, sensory neuropathy if it's more than two gram per day. There are newer medication. Uh, low mass siran was uh, approved by the uh, FDA in the US as a treatment for primary uh, hyperoxaluria type one. And it has shown be, to be effective. Uh, it's not wi widely used um, everywhere. And the second drug, the nido siran, um, is uh, still a phase one clinical trial. Um, for, um, uh, for trying to, um, as a reduction for calcium oxalate. Transplantation. So as I said, the option for type one would be definitely combined liver and kidney transplant to correct the enzymatic defect um, that was uh, be lacking in the native liver. Type two, I think people mention about liver on, uh, kidney only or liver only, but again, that's usually li combined liver and kidney transplant. And it's not clear for type three, if um, kidney alone with biodoxine would be effective, but that's been cases reported as, uh, as effective. What about pregnancy? This patient I've just mentioned now, she wanted to get pregnant. Uh, so it depends on if she's type two, she probably will, she had a combined liver and kidney, but if she was type three, for example, um, then she could have um, a kidney uh, alone with a biodoxine, but biodoxine should continue. Um, Biodoxine, there are controversial reports about giving it during pregnancy. So um, there was reports of um, teratogenicity, but also reports of successful pregnancy in, um, in patients with primary hyperoxaluria um, with a higher doses of biodoxine throughout pregnancy with no problem. So it's still controversial about giving it during pregnancy, um, especially it's been given in higher doses um, not the small doses sometimes used um, to relieve uh, nausea and vomiting pregnancy. So this is the, our first case. Um, second case um, is slightly or completely different. Um, she was uh, referred from uh, the pediatric nephrology transplant clinic in Manchester to uh, our center. Um, she was 19 year old by the time. It's a transient adolescent transplant clinic. Um, so she, she was, had a kidney transplant already by the time of the referral, functioning kidney transplant uh, from her mother at the age of 14. Past medical history, she failed to thrive at the age of one um, with proximal renal tubular dysfunction, Fanconi-like, a progressive CKD, subsequently on dialysis, and then a transplant at the 14, 
a diagnosis of cystinosis was already made and she was put and she came on cystamine to us. So that was a few years uh, back. Then I saw her in the clinic in the, the early this year and she, um, she was 25 by then and she had two important questions. She got married, she wanted to start a family and she was very concerned about her breath order by um, taking system, systamine um, and when she goes out, people can smell her odor and can smell her, uh, the, her breath and also her skin also sometimes smell like a fish uh, smell. So she was, that's a little too main concern for a young lady. And I'll tell you what I did, but let's talk about cystinosis a bit. Again, rare autosomal recessive uh, lysosomal storage disease, intracellular lysosomal accumulation of cysteine in different organs and tissue, uh, potentially severe dis the organ uh, dysfunction affecting more multi, multi uh, organs and multi system. Um, and because the defect in the gene that encodes cystino um, cystinocene, the protein that transports cysteine outside the lysosome, it just get accumulated inside there and can't get out, causing the damage. It's pure, poorly soluble and form crystals as well. Three known forms, the infantile, the nephropathic, that's uh, rare, more in the West, uh, more common in uh, France and the French part of Canada, Quebec. The, uh, that's the more severe leading to uh, endosagial disease. There is also the late onset juvenile, um, which is a milder, and there's a benign adult form which comes later and that doesn't cause endosagial disease, usually deposition of the crystal in the cornea and visual uh, issues and problems. The renal manifestations of the nephropathic, the, the most severe type, the infantile cystinosis, um, characterized by Fanconi type syndrome and um, a wasting of sodium, a urinary uh, considering defect, polyuria, polydepsia, acute uh, dehydration episodes, uh, losses of potassium, sodium, bicarb. Um, if it's early in life, uh, started early in life can, can, and not treated, can lead to um, rickets, um, hypophosphatemia hypouricemia, hypercalcuria, nephrocalcinosis stones, recurrent infections, obstructions, kidney failure. As you can see here, multi-system disease can affect the CNS, uh, causing various problems and issues, up to behavior problems, GIT, um, the, uh, the position uh, could affect the pancreas, causing diabetes, can affect, cause GIT bleed, uh, bone marrow deposition, band cytopenia, affecting the bones as well. And more common um, uh, target or, or a tissue to be targeted, the skin, they are usually fair skin, blonde, uh, light skin. Um, also the eyes, they usually complain about their eyes, deposition the cornea. The cornea is avascular, so um, systemic or oral um, systemine doesn't um, reach it. It has to be treated with uh, eye drops, cystamine um, eye drops, especially uh, eye drops to reach the cornea. Also, to affect the f fertility and uh, reproductive system. And we talked about the kidney causing all these issues leading to end stage renal disease. So you can see it's a multi system um, disease. How you make the diagnosis? Uh, probably easier than the first um, uh, case. Elevated cysteine content in the peripheral blood glucoside, and that's how I monitor the patient. Oh, you should monitor the patient. Um, and also, you can you can see the cysteine deposition crystals directly by the slit lamp in the cornea. And as I said, that could be quite painful if it's not uh, treated. And you can do genetic uh, uh, screening to see the uh, the defect, the gene defect. How you treat? Symptomatic fluid and electrolyte only on to replace the, the losses um, and um, the, the, the Fanconi syndrome, but the most effective treatment is cystamine. So cystamine, which is the cystacon, um, should be started as early as the diagnosis has been made to stop the deposition in various organs and uh, progression of CKD. Also, the, the, it improves things like growth retardation if, if the, the infantile type, which is type 1. Cystamine basically reduces cysteine accumulation inside the cell, inside most of the cells. Uh, but as I said, if the oral administration of cystamine will not reach the cornea, it has to be in eye drops. 
And the goal of the therapy is to keep the leukocyte cysteine levels below one um, per mi milligram protein. So that's uh, how you monitor the patient effectiveness. And you can, you can actually tell by doing that if they are compliant with um, cystamine or not. Because as I mentioned for a young lady, this, this medication causes her to smell. So when she goes out socially, it's really inconvenient for her. But I'll, I'll tell you what I did, which has helped her. So that's how you monitor the, the disease and you monitor the therapy as well, the compliance of therapy. Um, so for patients above age of 12 and over 50 kilogram, the recommended dose is two gram per day, divided on four times a day. And the maximum dose is 1.95 gram per meter square. Um, uh, as I mentioned a few times, that has to be orally admi uh, ocularly administered for the corneal deposits. And it shouldn't be used in pregnancy. It's this stratogenic. So it's different from the first case. And also, um, um, he, she can't breastfeed with it. So it's contraindicated. And that's clear. It has other side effects, multiple side effects. I mentioned about the smell of the breath and the skin also abnormal liver function, vomiting, so long list. So you can imagine that compliance would be an issue for young uh, adults, especially if they're already on, if they had a kidney transplant and they have to continue the medication after the transplantation. They will have a big challenge to have all this with that, have this histamine regularly as well. But it has to be regulated to stop the position in other organs, mainly after kidney transplantation. So a long list of side effects, seizures, lethargy, um, you can read all this uh, list uh, of side effects, but not necessarily. Uh, obviously, my experience with the case is limited. I've got two cases, um, but um, then not necessarily they will have everything, all these side effects. Um, so they usually do well. Um, in the UK, there is a society for cystinosis where all the patients with cystinosis, whether they will have a kidney transplant or not, they will join uh, yearly um, for a big conference, patient conference. And they share the experience, especially about pregnancy, about um, everything in life and how they cope with the medication and the side effects and the kidney disease, obviously. But they also have many groups that they can chat with and share the experience. And it's really supportive. So actually, my patient, the two patients I have, they actually more educated than me in the disease by attending this annual conference and, and, and knowing their disease and knowing patients from other places um, in the US and other places. Um, they talk to each other. So um, the, the extended release capsule um, should be avoided with PPI and alcohol because it can lead to um, uh, various levels of the, of, of the levels and it may, may not be effective. So after the medical treatment is a transplantation. So transplantation is, is not uh, the, the treatment of the disease. It's just when the patient develop end stage renal disease they can have a successful and excellent outcome of kidney transplant. And usually the cysteine doesn't um, accumulate or doesn't deposit in the tubules of the graft. It does appear in the interstitial cell, but it doesn't usually cause damage. Uh, so they have a good outcome after kidney transplantation, but they should still continue taking the cystamine and it's mainly for the other organs, particularly the cornea or whatever they, they have issues or problems with. So back to our case, my patient, as I mentioned, she's 25, she got married, she wants a baby, she's concerned about her breath order and um, cystamine. So what would you do then? That's uh, the last slide and her medication. She's on standard uh, anti-rejection dual therapy. She's on Cystagon, uh, big dose, 600. She's on eye drops from mercapterine and she can't live with the eye drops if they get shortage for any reason, she is suffering with the pain. I think that's her main concern. And she was an antihypertensive as well. So I'll, I'll share an experience which we got from Germany um, about this sister gun, because many, most patients will complain about smell um, and, and the odor of their breath and, and, and the skin, which is very inconvenient and many stop the medication. So we managed with the pharmacy, with, with one center in, in Germany who has experience to double coat the cystamine. So usually it has one, one coat as, as any capsule, but then the, our pharmacy um, do it themselves, they double coat it. So when it get released, it doesn't cause the smell and it has been effective. Also uh, be aware of the eye drops. It has to be in higher concentration to dissolve the crystal in the cornea. Otherwise, because there are many concentration that is less 
um, um, and, and less effective. So go back to pregnancy. So this is how we sorted her, um, the smell and the side effects, and we managed to do that. Pregnancy, um, she can obviously get pregnant. That's, um, she's a young lady and she wants to start family. Um, obviously you can see that um, some of the medication need to be changed. My fortic need to be changed to adesiprin. Um, Remipril has to stop to another uh, labitolor or other antihypertensive. But we said that cystagone is teratogenic for definite. She can't breastfeed after. Um, and the, the eye drops will be challenged to stopping. So I think patients will be counseled on stopping the medication during pregnancy uh, for teratogenicity. And, and obviously they at, the, at that period, the nine months, they will probably have risk of deposition. So it will be balance of benefit risk and what they, they, um, they will go for. But there are many successful reports of successful pregnancy in cystinosis. Um, with little effect on the graft if they are if they've got a kidney transplant. I think that's it. Thank you very much and happy to take questions now or later.